And it was after that when Oscar Lowenstein had become a part of Woodfall. And uh, he had the idea of making a film which would be three different directors. <clears throat> Originally, these were to be Carol Rice, Tony Richardson, and myself. Then Carol's uh, film, when worked on, turned out to be um, Morgan, a suitable case for treatment, and to be a feature film in its own. And it turned into a film uh, directed by Peter Brook, Tony Richardson, and myself, all supposedly from stories by Sheila Delaney. I was the first one to make my film, and it was from Sheila Delaney's story. And uh, I made it first, and I had a Czech cameraman whom I'd met in Prague uh, shooting a film for Miros Forman, Miroslav Ondracek. And that was the first time I worked with Mirek. <clears throat> and as I say, I was the first to make my film for the trilogy, The White Bass. And when Tony and Peter saw it, they both decided they'd better change their minds, change their subjects, and do something original. And that's how Peter made The Ride of the Valkyries and Tony made Red and Blue. In the end, the, this was a mistake. It, the the um, trilogy didn't have any wholeness to it. It wasn't um, a trilogy of stories by Sheila Delaney. And the film was never, I don't think it was ever shown uh, by United Artists as a trilogy. Uh, except much later there was a showing in New York. But in this country, uh, the films were split up and shown separately, not successfully. There was a chance that you were going to do this sport theme like a woodfall at one point. What happened to that? Well, um, it's a long story, as most stories about films are. I had read about <clears throat> The Sporting Life, the novel, and I thought it sounded interesting, and I got hold of it. Uh, it must have been... I must have been one of the first people to read it. In brief, I suggested it to Tony Richardson as a film for me to make for Woodfall. Tony saw me quite shortly afterwards and said, I, I've read this sporting life, I don't think it's a good subject for you, i.e. me. And uh, then I discovered that Tony uh, had put in a, bud, a bid for the sporting life to make himself. He didn't, in fact, get the film, which was bought by the Rank Organization. And the Rank Organization gave it to uh, independent artists who asked Carol Rice to direct it. Carol having made Saturday Night and Sunday Morning. Carol didn't want to direct it or a film then, and he came to me and he said, well, shall I suggest you to direct it? And uh, I'll, in other words, Carol would be a producer. And I said, fine, you can try. And um, came back to me the next day, and he said they've agreed. And that's how I made the Sporting Life, which is a, an independent artist's production for distribution by the Rank Organization. Can we come on to free cinema now on, on some of your statements that you, uh, you said? Yes, all this of course happened before. before. Free cinema was uh, started in 56. Yeah. The artist must always the artist must always aim beyond, beyond the limits of tolerance. His duty is to be a monster. Do you know when I said that? Or where? Is this in one of the articles? Um, Probably. Uh, what you've got to remember is that those kind of statements that one makes, they always were, they always are, done with an eye on publicity, if you like, on the media. I don't think that one can tell the truth. So that uh, although, for instance, what you've just said is not something I disagree with, you always do have to see it in the context of someone who was uh, hoping to attract attention 
to his films and the films of his friends, which is what we call free cinema. Mm. I think in those days we did strongly believe in um, nonconformism, if you like, in making films that were not in the swim. And in that respect, I think that uh, free cinema had much in common with Woodfall later. And I think that uh, filmmaking in those days was very different from what it is today. And today, unfortunately, I think the emphasis is very much more on success. So we did, um, although we, we wanted to be um, industry filmmakers, if you like, we were um, quite outspoken and probably believed in the possibility of change. That is the essence of the work of those days. We believed in the possibility of change, doing things in a new way, most particularly with free cinema and with uh, Woodfall, of course, um, doing subjects that were, shall we say, working class in origin in a way that the British cinema up to then had really not been. British cinema has almost always been, at least before the advent of television, uh, a middle class a medium. And uh, I think that our work in those days, we might have been middle class, but the work was not, and it wasn't inspired by writers who were middle class, as David Storey was not middle class, nor was Sheila Delaney. Or, I suppose, Alan Sillitoe. With reference to Stand Up, Stand Up, your, perhaps your most famous article, the one that attracted the most attention, you said, I wish to affirm my belief in the dignity of criticism, for the critic should be more than a parasite. Yeah, <clears throat> well, to be honest, uh, I was always rather surprised that uh, Stand Up, Stand Up should have caused as much of a stir as it did, because uh, it seemed to me that I was stating the obvious. I think I was stating the obvious, but unfortunately I think critics in this country have always been middle class and um, appealing to a middle class readership. And that probably has led to them trying to, shall I say, trying to please. You have to remember that Britain was and is a, um, a Philistine society, one where the values of art are not taken seriously or understood, and that the British cinema has almost always been middle class. And that perhaps is one of the reasons why uh, the American cinema has been the cinema of the populace, the popular cinema. And I think really um, the British don't want it any different. Probably why in the end, Woodfall didn't thrive. It had one huge success, Tom Jones. Tom Jones. And apart from that, I would say Woodfall's films were probably not hugely successful. What do you think of the Charge of the Light Brigade? Well, I think Charge of the Light Brigade is in many ways a very remarkable film. It's uh, true to <clears throat> the Woodfall uh, philosophy, if you like, of being against um, privileged Britain, uh, privilege being represented by the British cinema, about, no, by the British army <clears throat> in the Charge of Life Brigade. I think the problem with the charge is actually that the end of the film, I think, is a bit of a muddle. That's my personal opinion. And it wasn't totally clarified for the audience or the critics. And I think that's one of the reasons why it wasn't a great popular success. Do you think that's true? Uh, yes, it's, <clears throat> it comes over as, as quite realism, as, as an aspect of realism in, in the way that the charge is portrayed. It's, lo it's a long way from the sort of, you know, really heroic. Oh, <clears throat> there was no intention to make a, um, an equivalent to the 
old Warner Brothers film with Errol Flynn. In that respect, its picture of society is very much truer than an American picture. But in terms of dramaturgy, I think you have to examine the, um, the plan, the motivations of the charge itself. And it's very important when you do a film like that, that an audience knows exactly what you're talking about. And I'm not sure the audience really did ever know. What makes visual poetry? What makes visual poetry? I have no idea. I would imagine a poetic spirit uh, on the part of the filmmaker, the director. And uh, if I have to try and think about it, um, I suppose I would say that poetry in the cinema is something that goes be beyond the naturalistic surface, something that implies um, greater um, issues, perspectives, depths, than would be contained in a simple narrative. So, I mean, you can take a film like If, if you like, you know, If, which is, uh, <clears throat> I think, was received naturally by the British press in a pretty crass kind of way. But the essence of If is that it is a film about British public schools, the public school system, but it's also uh, an allegory in many ways, one that can be understood and liked in countries outside Britain. In fact, I think it's always been more successful abroad than it has been in this country. Mm, it's an allegory of British society to some degree. To, to well, you can either say it's an allegory of British society or you can say it is a, <clears throat> an allegory of... Um, What? Um, well, what is the film about? It's about authority, really. Mm, yes. <clears throat> I think it's about authority and uh, the subjects of authority. And uh, in that respect, uh, if you like, an audience in Poland or the Argentine or America will understand it uh, in terms of their own societies and their own lives. Mm. The first duty of an artist is not to interpret or propagandise, but to create. Yes, whatever that means, yes. You agree with that, when you rewrote it? <laughs> oh, yes, yes. <clears throat> That's absolutely true. I mean, after all, the, the, um, the principle then was apt to be uh, that art that wasn't commercial should be uh, propagandist. And uh, we didn't believe in propaganda. So all these things, you know, have to be um, said with certain reservations, if you like, or ambiguities, because, of course, from another point of view, you can say that all art is propagandist. Um, it's propaganda for a way of life. I think it was Humphrey Jennings who said that his films were propaganda for the human race. Well, you can... Um, you can sort that out. That was his way of creating. What's the next question? Well, I wanted to talk about Humphrey Jennings. Um, surrealism. Humphrey Jennings was influenced by the surrealists. White bus seems to be on chandelier for the 60s. Oh, lucky man bears strong elements of surrealism. Although you've never written about really? surrealism. Well, I mean, there are bits that... <clears throat> it's true that Humphrey Jennings, as a painter, was um, influenced by um, continental ideas of surrealism. And maybe he painted some uh, surrealist pictures. But I don't think Humphrey Jennings's um, films were ever surreal. Uh, his films are extremely poetic. They um, illustrate his values, his conception of Britain or the British people. But they're not surreal, and I don't honestly think... No, I'm either. not saying that they are surreal, but I mm. mean, his, his work, his life was influenced by surrealism. I mean, for instance, in The White Bus, you've got the, the woman suddenly seen amongst the cleaners hanging off the ceiling. Hanging That's them. true. I never know. Would you call that surreal, or would you call it uh, symbolic? 
I don't honestly know. I mean, if one takes surrealism as being the, um, the poetry of the unconscious, then um, I don't know that uh, I've ever made surreal films because I think that um, the non-naturalistic things oh, yes, in right. my films for instance, um, you, you've got the, the vicar that reappears in the drawer when he well, pulls the drawer out. That's correct. Now, but the thing is that you can analyse that in, uh, if you like, symbolic terms, can't you? You can say, well, that's where the establishment, represented by the headmaster, keep religion. In the drawer? Yes. Say, yeah. And in that respect, that's not a surreal image. It's not a naturalistic image. There is a difference. What was working with Sheila Delaney like? Very pleasant. I mean, I met Sheila when it was Oscar Lernstein, though he's forgotten it, but it was he who'd suggested the white bus, I think, which was in Sheila's collection, Sweetly Sings the Donkey, which I didn't know. And I read it, and then I said to Oscar, well, I'll work with Sheila on the script, and if we get on, I'll be happy to do the film. So I met Sheila, we started talking together, we wrote a script together, we did get on. Um, I would say that effort effortlessly, uh, Sheila, Sheila and I thought in the same way, and uh, it wasn't certainly a naturalistic way. Um, I did at one time suggest to Sheila that she should play the part in The White Bus of the Girl, since it was a, a, an autobiographical piece, really. But she didn't want to. I'm sure she was right. Um, and she suggested uh, Patricia Healy, for which I'm very grateful to her. Mm. Right. You see, The White Bus was originally about the reception given to Sheila in Salford when she wrote A Taste of Honey, and they thought that she had insulted Salford. And I think even possibly they did um, invent something, kind of a tour of the city, See Your City, where they took visitors around in a bus to justify the fact that Salford was really a, a tip-top... Nice um, yeah, that's right. And that's how that began. Uh, it went further, I would say, in the film, uh, where you do have the visitors, of course, from over, all over the world in the bus. Uh, you had some uh, a Japanese lady and you had the uh, gentleman from Central Europe. Um, but I think um, by the end of the film, I would say that the White Bus is more about life than about Britain. And I think this is a pattern, probably, in most of the films that I've made. All right. To go on to the historical aspects, or, or as they would appear now. I was born in 1956, the year free cinema started, also the year of Suez. And to me today, the films of free cinema look like historical documents. Walter Lassley says this wasn't intended, but Covent Garden today is a tourist attraction that sells things like solid brass presses for two of them. Well, Covent Garden has been destroyed. I mean, the Covent Garden that we knew in the film has been destroyed and removed, hasn't it? And you're quite right, it's now a tourist trap. And the whole way of life that is represented by the Covent Garden of every day except Christmas no longer exists. I suppose it's difficult for me to tell because um, if I see every day, it's quite present to me, you know. But I suppose that the people, the characters in every day, seem almost Dickensian. I mean, I you're talking about um, Jenny, who, who started selling flowers on the streets of London when Queen Victoria was on the throne. And, and stuff mm. like that. I mean, it, it comes from a different world almost, and, and the street bands and stuff like that. You just wouldn't. Well, I, you're quite right, but I'm not sure that that band doesn't still exist, as a matter of fact, you know. Um, they did for many years after that, I know. Uh, but uh, listen, of course, it's about when it was made. What was it, 1957? 57, yeah. 50, 60, 70, 80, 35 years ago. Mm. Uh, and things have changed since then. Um, 
some things are better, some things not. I think that we are now in a conformist society and a success society. Um, the apparatus that you're using to make this um, this film with didn't exist in those days. Mm. We used a, uh, a handheld Aeroflex camera and we didn't have a blimped camera. So um, all the sound in every day except Christmas is, um, with very, very few exceptions, it's post-synced. It manages to be quite naturalistic. I mean, it doesn't look like a... It doesn't look like it is post synced. You know, I mean, it's not. It doesn't jar that it's. Well, no, there's no reason why it should. But if you, I mean, that's because we knew our jobs. You know. Mm. I mean, there is a tendency today, I suppose, to patronise the past. But the truth is that after all, Jennings, when he mixed "Listen to Britain," he didn't have tape or modern mixing apparatus or something like that. He did it off a gramophone record, I think. But uh, people can't do any better now. They can't make better films. In a certain respect, I think, um, all the technical advances since the days of the 50s, if you like, have um, not improved films creatively. I mean, if you take this Sporting Life, which was made in 1962, um, well, it's, it's uh, in no respect handicapped by the date in which it was made. I think, apart from being in black and white, uh, I suppose it's perfectly modern. Just to cover one of the books you wrote, um, the book on secret people is about the only one that covers the factory process as it existed in Britain, Britain at Ealing. <clears throat> yes, it's interesting in that way, yes. Secret People was um, um, a pity because uh, I knew Thorold Dickinson and he wanted me to do a book about the making of the film. Um, but <clears throat> I knew when I was doing it that there were certain <coughs> errors in the script and I knew that the film would be a failure. There was nothing whatever I could do about it and I couldn't say in the book everything that I thought. I didn't want to hurt people's feelings particularly. But I think what it does do is, criticism apart, <coughs> it does give a very fair factual account of what it was like to make a film at Ealing in those days. Walter, um, he only photographed uh, documentary films for me, but extremely well. I think that uh, Every Day Except Christmas is a very, very, very well shot film, you know. It's a, a huge contribution there. Now, uh, I'm jumping about a bit, something that you could probably take hours on. Why do you admire John Ford so much? Well, <clears throat> um, one's responses uh, can't always be analysed. Speaking very briefly, I would say that uh, Ford was a director who, in a remarkable way, managed to be a film industry director through all his life and yet to preserve something very personal about the way he made films and about the values that he put into his films. I think the other thing about Ford that I have always responded to is his combination of an anti-authoritarian bias together with a strong sense of tradition. I think Ford, in his best work, had both. And these, apart from a very strong human response, which is evident in his films. Um, this, quite apart from the fact that he happened to be an absolutely brilliant filmmaker, he, knew how to put films together, knew about camera, knew about editing. Um, I would think that Ford is not today hugely popular amongst the young, precisely because he was someone who had um, strong, a strong sense of values, a strong moral sense.
it's evident in Paul's pictures, they will prefer directors, I think, who don't show a moral sense in their films, because that makes them seem old-fashioned to the young today. Humphrey Jennings needed the hot blast of war to warm him to passion. What warms you to passion? I don't think I need anything. You don't? No, I think it's a question of temperament. I mean, I do know that uh, without in any way being a sort of kilt-wearing Scotsman, but uh, I have been born to realise that I am three-quarters Scottish, Celtic by blood, and this has made me uh, often at odds with the English. There is a great difference, I think, between the Celts and the Anglo-Saxons. And one of the things about the Anglo-Saxons is that they are not uh, strongly emotional, not strongly poetic. I don't think I needed anything to, um, to make me what, emotional or poetic. Mm -hmm. Why do you believe direct cinema is awful rubbish? Well, you'd have to define what direct cinema is. Oh, I, I find it a very fluid boundary between direct cinema and, and, and the other bits and pieces which seem to be of it. Cin well, I think that a lot of the claims that were made by, of direct cinema by um, people who practised it and p people who <clears throat> particularly were using the new media of tape and tape recorders, uh, a lot of the... Um, claims that were made were, were rubbish, which actually tried to make out that no film was worth anything unless it adopted the methods of uh, direct cinema. And uh, that invention, manipulation, the whole um, business, if you like, of what art is, they would make out that these were illegitimate. So a film like Every Day Except Christmas, I suppose, would be illegitimate to them. Mm because um, the uh, sound, the dialogue, footsteps, cries, everything else, was uh, invented and uh, post-sync. They, they thought that you could only make a good film if you used uh, direct sound, which, of course, is nonsense. And uh, most often, I think, uh, results in um, fettering the film if you like. I mean, if you're tied down to talking heads. Mm. That's what um, direct cinema likes. One of the comments about, um, or, or the comparisons between your work and that of the wartime documentaries, and specifically with regard to Every Day Except Christmas, that if in, you know, the wartime documentaries well, well, so, so w would have covered things like how much they earned and, and the so more, more like the social... I don't know that they would, would they? I think you're... That's one of the comments I read. You may have read it. Who said that? That idiot Arthur Elton, I suppose, was it? Someone but it's quite untrue. I mean, you look at a film like... Um, I, I think you're wrong when you say wartime documentary. I mean, a film like Target... Something like Housing Problems, so... Oh, well, that's not wartime, is it? Well... It's about 1935. Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but don't forget that Housing Problems was a very specific film made about a very specific subject and made for the gas company. Um, I think that it was Arthur Elton who complained about every day and said that uh, we didn't know the conditions of work of these people or how much money they got paid. Well, I think that's just quibbling, really. Um, I think you can say there was a great difference between free cinema and between the documentary cinema of John Grierson Yes. which was <clears throat> very much more propagandist and, I would say, respectful of authority. I think that the, when it came to the war, the British films made during the war uh, were respectful, naturally, of authority, as Humphrey Jennings was respectful of tradition and authority. They weren't in any way, uh, shall I say, rebellious. And our films, I mean, from look back onwards, if you like, were extremely critical of authority mm. and particularly of the class system. 
because you run into problems with every day except Christmas at the festivals, I, from what I remember. I didn't run into problems with... Um, or, or they did. They thought it didn't show... That was the British, print. not yes. the festival. That's right, yes. No, <clears throat> the festival gave it the Grand Prix. That's right, yes. But the British, of course, didn't like it because the British were making films about Benjamin Britten and springtime. Right. I don't think free cinema was ever particularly popular in this country, and I would say that even the youth culture of, say, Time Out were not in the least um, pro-free cinema. They were all uh, influenced by the French and writing articles about um, Otto Preminger and Howard Hawks. The, the British have never been um, a great help to artists in their own country. I mean, it's interesting when Orwell writes about the English, he, um, he makes the point that the English, on the whole, don't favour their own artists, they favour foreign artists. And that's pretty well true in different ways today, and I would say today that the, um, the English, the media, are very pro-American. Barry Norman is pretty pro-American, isn't he? The kind of people he will interview, the kind of people whom the BBC will think is worth interviewing. If you go down to the National Film Theatre and you look um, outside, <clears throat> you walk down to the National Theatre, and on the left-hand side there are all the pictures on the wall, blown up pictures, portraits of um, actors and stars throughout the history of the cinema, uh, you'll perhaps notice not one of them is British. And I've said this often enough, but they just laugh. Is your point of view always a social one? No. Or do you always approach a subject from a human point of view? I don't think you can make that distinction. I think the important thing is to say that you can't make a film from a human point of view with, without some uh, awareness of uh, society. And I think that's one of the reasons why I have always liked very much David Story's plays. David has never written um, social plays from a propagandist point of view, uh, but the um, social facts are always there in the background. At the same time, he, his plays are extremely emotional. And it is the combination of the two that's, that's important, I think. Do you still think the best way to publicise a group of films is to form a movement? Oh, yes. I mean, uh, I take that, um, if you like, purely uh, from a journalistic point of view, you know. If you want to get space uh, in the press, now in the, um, in te on television, you've got to think, what's the way to make a splash? You can either do it by being personally outrageous or by getting together with some people and f making a manifesto of some kind. Mm. Um, I don't say that the manifesto needs to be insincere, but you've got to cook it up a bit. I mean, one can't respect the media, particularly not in a Philistine society where what, who they're having to appeal to, the audience, is Philistine. Mm. Each man kills the things he loves. That's, some, that's one of the things that you say. Do you know who wrote that? No, I don't, I don't. That is a quotation from uh, The Ballad of Reading Jail by Oscar Wilde. Anyway, yeah. yeah. But, you, but you believe that? Each man kills the thing he loves. I don't know, did I say that? Well, you're quoted as that being, that being one of your favourites. Oh, that's rather interesting. You know, I do think very, very often, <clears throat> unfortunately, artists, or particularly filmmakers, are asked to explain their work and to answer questions that should more properly be answered by critics if we had any good ones, which we haven't. Um, I think that each man kills the thing he loves is a rather interesting comment on satire. Um, because I think it's, it's good if, in 
satirizing certain institutions, you also have a fondness for them. And I suppose that might be true of if. I think, interestingly, it isn't true of uh, Britannia Hospital, which was made later, and uh, is, I think, in the end, it's a much um, blacker. It's an allegory for a different society, it seems. In, in a life. different society or human life, for that matter. I mean, it's about the idiocy of human beings, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. But, but you, there are elements of the modern conservative privatization and stuff. In the, I thought in, in the in the in the add-on wing, funded by the is it Yuzuki or Kazuki oh. Corporation. Well, it's a nice thought. Yes, there are. There is a, an element of it. Yes, with the Jap who comes in and um, bows. There's an element of that there. Yes, I think there's bound to be. But it's not a film about privatization, of course. The trouble with Britannia Hospital may be that it's about too many things. And it is a film that unfortunately invites critics and audiences to think, which is always a big mistake. Because people don't want to think when they go to the cinema. Mm. They're, they're got, incapable of it. You've got Malcolm McDowell and, and Biles also goes through all three films, doesn't he? Through yes. That's right. Plays the same type of character. But Malcolm, no, they don't. Actually, I would say that Malcolm's character from If, O Lucky Man in Britannia Hospital is very, very different. And by the time you get to Britannia Hospital, he's thoroughly corrupt. He's become a sort of media merchant, oh, yes, hasn't right, he? Yes. So he's not. If you like, he is and he isn't, but he's, he's definitely changed. I was thinking more of Biles when I said that. That seems to be the same. I think Biles is perhaps much the same, yes. But these things were not particularly intentional, you know. See, when you make a film, you don't sit down and think, now, what am I going to say? You tell a story. I mean, you do both think and invent, both. It was said that together, Mama Don't Allow and O oh Dreamland stand out sharply on their own as the first signs for some time of a fundamental progressive personal approach to exploring contemporary life in this country through cinema. Who said that? I can't remember now. Well, OK. And what about it? Well, sorry. You mean, do I agree? Yes. Well, I think the films are satires. And of course, you also have to remember that what uh, the American writer George Kaufman said, I think, was satire is what closes on Saturday night. And uh, audiences don't like satire. <clears throat> the British tradition is not for satire. The, the uh, British tradition is for a kind of humour that's very much more facetious. Mm -hmm. And that's why you get um, Monty Python <clears throat> so hugely popular. Because in the end, Monty Python doesn't want to change anything or destroy anything, does mm. it? But, I mean, a film like I'm All Right, Jack, which... There's some similarities in the management and mm -hmm. union to, to Britannia Hospital, I thought was... <clears throat> well, I'm sure it did. I mean, I haven't seen it recently, but um, I think it was a you very... It was both being corrupt to some degree, both management and workers. Does it? Yes. I, I, I can't remember. Isn't I'm All Right, Jack, very much more pro-management and more anti-union? I, I don't know. That was... I wouldn't have thought said so, no, actually. Oh, well, you may be right. Yes, I'd have to see it again. Right, one for the... How were you influenced by Humphrey Jennings? <clears throat> you know, this is, again, one of those <clears throat> uh, questions that ought to be answered by a critic. I don't think that um, influence, on the whole, is apt to be conscious. Um... But I think that um, certainly earlier on, a lot of the way that um, Humphrey Jennings used cinema, I think you'd find in the, uh, some of the early free cinema films, his whole <clears throat> uh, manipulation of sound and image, the overlapping of sound and image, is, um, has been very influential on those films. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that Jennings was a, a, a director who instinctively believed in uh, the personal use of cinema and uh, the cinema as something that is about um, 
national uh, pride. pride, personality, yes. Mm. And a very strong, just a very strong human feeling, which really um, separates him very much from most British documentaries. Because you've got quite a few things to say about national pride in it, or the, the guy who plays the general general. Oh, right. Person. Well, that's rather um, satirised, isn't it? Mm. Yes. Yes. I don't know, quite likely Jennings wouldn't have liked it. How do you feel film criticism has advanced since the days when you wrote Stand Up, Stand Up? Well, do you think it has advanced? Not particularly, no. No. <clears throat> I don't think film criticism has advanced, perhaps chiefly because uh, the media have become more and more powerful. And criticism for the media can't be all that serious because it has to appeal to a public. And that's true on television, of course, too. And criticism is pretty well bound to be um, on the level of its audience. If it's above the level of its audience, the critic will soon lose his job. job. Hmm. Yeah. What do you think of the label's kitchen sink and working class realism? They were used to rather put down, throw away. I mean, Alexander <coughs> Walker um, had great joy in, di in, di in saying that it, it, it had ended one year. You mean the year the kitchen sink went down the drain? That's right, yes. That's right. I often wonder, I've never asked Alex that actually, whether he wrote that, because it was a headline. It's quite possible it was written by somebody else. <clears throat> but I do think the use of the word kitchen sink is very, very typical of our middle-class society and our middle-class cinema, whereby it has to be drawn attention um, to the fact that, uh, if you like, that a film or a play is about uh, working-class people. Uh, I don't know whether that's so true now. Possibly not so true of television. Uh, mm. But I think it's uh, a phrase, a label, that betrays the values of the person who uses it. Do you feel the working class are still unrepresented in cinema? No, not particularly, since now that... Um, I suppose there is a working class now, is it? Well, <coughs> They're all the Conservatives would have us believe class. there wasn't one. Hmm? The Conservatives would have us believe there wasn't a working class. But, uh, yes. I mean, there's still... I mean, certainly in Coventry, there's very much a working class. The great problem, honestly, is that uh, many working class uh, issues and uh, are dealt with, in, particularly in television, television plays, that sort of thing. But there's very little demand that this uh, treatment should be truthful or um, abrasive in any way. Because, um, as I say, I have been driven through experience to feel that the English, on the whole, are Philistine and conformist. If one isn't oneself Philistine and conformist, it's rather hard to make films for them. That's quite a bleak view, actually. I can't find oh, it is bleak, of course. <clears throat> but look at, uh, as I say, you look at um, Botanic Hospital, it's a bleak film. That's one of the reasons why it was disliked. The Free Cinema Manifesto said, Perfection is not an aim. The image speaks, sound amplifies and comments. No film can be too personal. Size is irrelevant. A style means an attitude, and attitude means a style. How do you view these statements now? Quite well, pretty good. There you go. <coughs> good publicity, that's, I mean, that's mm -hmm. basic. Good publicity. Well, of course. I mean, that's why I say you've got to consider all these things in relation to the time at which they were written, the purpose for which they were written, and, uh, of course, but when you say good publicity, do you mean that in a pejorative way? No, no, I mean, good publicity, it's, it's... Well, you, that's right, it's ideally both. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't say we didn't believe those things. Very idealistic. It's, well, it's, it seems I. I I think that we were idealistic, and I think that's the great difference between the 50s and the 60s, if you like, and today. I don't think people are idealistic anymore. As I say, they're, they're out for success, aren't they? Mm. Well, I do like free cinema films. And well, that means something. It's been a minority. You probably are in a minority. <laughs> Good for you, yeah.
O Dreamman was one of your first free cinema films. To what extent was it influenced by your previous commercial work? Oh, not at all. <clears throat> I mean, I didn't make uh, O Dreamland. When I made O Dreamland, anyway, we'd never heard of free cinema. Nobody's ever thought of it, you know. I just made it uh, because I wanted to make it, the way you'd sit down and paint a picture or write a poem, you know. It came in very handy in 1956, when we launched free cinema, that I had made O Dreamland some years before and done nothing with it. There wasn't anything to do with it. Well, you're right, but are they um, explosive? The films we make? Mm. <laughs> well, you've got not to worry about <clears throat> getting your films broadcast until you've made them, if you like. And when I say explosive, I mean, can you make a, um, uh, an explosion with them? Can you get together and be a, um, form a new movement? It's just a handle for journalists to be able to grab hold of. I mean, I agree with you, it's so difficult now because, <clears throat> I mean, everybody's making films. There are too many films made. There are too many images altogether. Uh, but I think um, a film does reflect whatever you personally happen to think or feel. And that's the important thing, not whether you're going to get it shown or not. I mean, I do remember at one time I think even saying that, of course, one the amazing thing is one could make a film about anything. And the truth is, oh, sorry. Uh, the truth is, you. Um, what matters is not the subject. What matters is the feeling you bring to it. And I'm often surprised that if you look at something like Oh Dreamland, uh, I'm surprised that the same thing is not made today about a shopping mall. But if it's made about a shopping mall, it has to be um, made with those feelings of rebelliousness or criticism or whatever you like inside. It's not a question of the subject. A hundred people can go and walk down, walk around a thousand people, walk around dreamland uh, and not see a film there. And Gavin, Gavin Lambert described it like this. For ten minutes it assaults the eyes and ear with a rough-edged but sharp central impression of this South Coast amusement park, in which the ugliness and degradation and most of the distractions which are symbolised by the mocking mechanical laughter of a dummy sailor. People stare at a child blink. Suddenly an enormous woman creeps forward. Gaunt women at gambling tables are like factory line signs of real vitality. How would you describe our dreamland today? You know, well, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Hmm. <clears throat> I don't know. I haven't been to dreamland recently. I think that um, the general technological standards of things has improved superficially. So one's uh, way of treating it today would have to be different. One would have different feelings. Have you made a film like that? No, I haven't. Ah. Well, what have you made films about? Uh, one was based on Franz Kafka's The Trial, which was about 20 minutes long. Oh, well, that's interesting. Yes. It's very interesting because Lorenzo Mazzetti, who made Together, she had previously, at the Slade, made a Kafka film, um, The Metamorphosis. Mm. It's very good. How do you think the British New Wave compared with the French New Wave? Well, I think it's very difficult to compare because I think the conditions of the two societies are very, very different. I think from the beginning the British New Wave had to combat a very entrenched class system. And you see how that sense of class is uh, present in most British films, uh, as in the Charles of Light Brigade, for instance, very strongly present. But the British on the whole, the English particularly, don't like that being drawn attention to. I think there isn't the same kind of thing in the French New Wave, which also was not socially biased. I think the French New Wave was very much more um, bourgeois from the beginning. It was always middle class, which is probably why the English liked it. And their actor can give a film po poetic validity on his own. Well, I suppose that's true. <coughs> I mean, um, if you like, Fonda had to have Ford. 
Ford had to have Fonda. Um, what do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, no, no one can make something on their own. Lucy says, I find the auteur theory rather. The auteur theory is such rubbish, actually. I mean, it was perhaps it had some uh, use when it was coined. But you can see, interestingly, again, how the media have taken advantage of the auteur theory. The only person who's ever mentioned in relation to a film now is the director. And uh, we, we, when I say that everybody's become very conformist, I think they really have, you know. I think that uh, there's terribly little questioning of things that go on around us. Um, very little questioning of the media, I think, isn't there? Well, the media show tries, for instance. I don't know if you've seen the media show. No, I probably haven't. No. Does it? Well, yes, it does show... But then they're part of the media. Well, yes, <laughs> but they do turn it inside out to some degree and show the way, for instance, that the people covering the what, election... Um, what programme's that on? Channel 4. Channel 4, mm-hmm. Used to have Muriel Gray as the presenter. Oh, God, she was awful, wasn't she? Tony Richardson categorised directors according to the relationship he discovered between them and their subjects. Those who dominate their material and those who translate without transforming it, and a third group who work between these extremes. Some directors create their own worlds, others do not. You commented, it is less a question of dominating one's material than of being truthful to it. How would you describe your relationship to your material? Very close. Very close. Hmm. I think I've never really been able to make anything that didn't reflect very strongly the way I feel and think about things. I mean, that's, <clears throat> if, if anything, that is the, what is distinctive about the films I've made and probably the reason why they are not um, all that celebrated. Because the way I do think and feel about things, which is to a great extent critical, is not popular. Is it? Mm. Can, I, can I come to, without, to, to a severe critic of free cinema? Now, we, we, I don't... Of course you can. I don't, don't want you to take it personally. No. Um, Ray Dergnat, free cinema's... Oh. Fiercest critic. He's a nice chap, Ray Dergnat, but he gets very muddled. Says that every day except Christmas is a subaltern's view of Covent Garden Porters. It should have been titled In Which We Serve. Free cinema is sentimental propaganda masquerading as sociological discovery. Anderson and Rice must have sensed how carefully they were editing reality, but they preferred to ingratiate the workers with the middle class audience for artistic documentaries. Free cinema, hardly call it rather elegiac cinema, since it masochistically weeps the passing of a past presented not as a viable means of life, but as a morbidly fascinating, romanticising slums is a well-known facet of bourgeois masochism. It's a bit pathetic, really, but I mean, <clears throat> unfortunately that's more about Raymond Dergnat than it is about the films. And he says, oh, does Anderson and Rice, what is it, try and... Um, must have sensed how great carefully they were editing reality. It was in but it begs so many questions. I mean, I would say that, uh, of course, one edits reality. Any artist edits reality. Who's ever pretended they don't? I don't know. I mean, you can't... There's no way of putting reality uh, in a surface sense. There's no way of putting that on the stage. You can only put your own vision of or interpretation of or response to reality. It's one's own um, imp- one's own feelings, one's own impulse, one's own imagination, of course. Grierson produced a damn don't cry about a mining disaster, you know. OK, traditional subject. But uh, in fact, we, so to speak, Free Cinema, did represent a strongly critical, bolshy, if you like, attitude, very much opposed to Grierson. And, you know, poor old Grierson ended up, what, um, presenting a television programme, wasn't it called This Wonderful World? 
you know, at his best. You call him Dr. Grayson in, in your letter, Dr. Grayson. That's right. Um, is that that long letter I wrote? I think so. In yeah. Sight and Sound? Yes, I did write a yes, long it was, letter. It was a, yes, it was a letter. Yes, I've got it. In right attacking now. him. Because uh, you... Um, is it Swan? Dr. Grayson states that I it's well known and hot at Oxford that I'm totally absorbed with John Ford and I wouldn't say anything bad about John Ford or some words to that effect. No, it's rather sad. It's sad. <clears throat> but uh, Grayson was never... He, he said some good things, but he was never an artist, really. And that's why, for instance, he never liked, really liked Humphrey Jennings. Because Humphrey Jennings was an artist, and uh, mm. Grayson was a sort of schoolmaster or propagandist. Listen to Britain's my favourite Jennings film, which is yours. Sorry, Tom. Well, I think it's a game you shouldn't really play, but I think it's perfectly reasonable to call Listen to Britain. Um, your favourite film. One of them, anyway. Partly because it has no commentary, so it is it is film at its most pure. And you can like, uh, I mean, uh, A Diary for Timothy, mm. very much. I think perhaps the end of that's not very resolved. And uh, Fires Were Started. Mm. And uh, one or two of the short films, um, Words for Battle, um, Etc. But I think you, you listen. If you said that uh, uh, "Listen to Britain" is Jennings at his purest, mm. you would probably be correct. It's very good the way they synchronise the machines with the with the workers and the music. And, yes. And the train and, the, and the, the truck goes underneath the railway while well, the train is Of course, it's very, yeah, it is very good. Yes. And I mean the um, the whole uh, selection of images is brilliant. Yes. And Isn't it? Put, yes, it portrays the working class from well, well, it portrays aspects or all over the upper class. Well, it's perfectly true, and I think that in the war, you see, those those issues of class were less obvious. Um, do you think that the working class is not represented in British cinema still? Uh, the working class, as I know it, doesn't get that much of a showing now. No. Well, here's your chance. Because the whole thing about uh, Oh Lucky Man, of course, is that it's... Um, I suppose it might be called Brecht in a way. And there's never a pretense that you weren't seeing a film. And um, at the very beginning, when Alan Price is playing his numbers, you know. You appear in the film. That's right. Hmm. When and then, of course, when Malcolm comes up to uh, be tested at the very end, you know, those are uh, attitudes of if, really, aren't they? Mm. Carrying the books and the gun. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yes, well, those are the kind of things that either amuse you or annoy you. And I find them very, very interesting. Good. Yeah. Yes. Well, when yeah. you choose that music, I mean, I went out and bought the record in it. The old, the Congolese... The mass. Mm. Well, I think we chose it because it was the kind of thing that would make you go out and buy the record. I mean, in other words, <laughs> it, it seemed right. We liked it. I think that David Sherwin told me that he and John Howlett used to play this when they were um, writing the original draft of If. But I needed to get something. I knew we had to have a piece of music which would characterize Mick. And uh, as I think that does, it's um, primitive in a certain way, you know, strongly rhythmic, very strongly emotional, mm. kind of thing you might respond to. And well, they become rebels. So. That's right. What made you think of the, the sequences where they, where they have the, the collage on the wall and the it's just... Well, I don't know. What, I mean, that was a sequence, actually. Uh, you mean when he was firing? Mm. And he, that collage is quite... I mean, that actually got me interested in collage as well. <laughs> so. yeah, we made the collages for it. And uh, at, at, at the, before that, I didn't know what there should be in that <coughs> section of the film. And David hadn't written that. But we um, 
after the film was shot, we did some more shooting, and that was one of the sequences we had to do. And I think it was just the day before we shot it that uh, I said, I know what we should do. We should make collages. It just happened like that. It started because Mirak was scared of the chapel sequences. And he said that unless we had more time to do them or he had more lamps, we wouldn't be able to get the correct exposure for color. And we wondered what we should do. And it was in the end I got the idea of, uh, well, we shoot those sequences in black and white. And once you do that, of course, you have to choose other sequences in the film. Mm. And of course, it is also a, um, an echo of The White Bus, which is a black and white film with some oh, color sequences. Yes. And I think, you know, that one of the things about that in If is that what I wanted to do was to shoot a film in which anything could happen. In other words, at the end, there is this, I don't know, poetic idea of a revolution, but in which that could happen because the film had not been purely naturalistic up to that point. And um, one of the ways of not being purely naturalistic, I thought, was to vary the surface of the film in between color and monochrome. So the, if it isn't shot ever in a um, fantastic way, <coughs> you know, it's, um, it's perfectly realistically shot, but with this element that uh, perhaps can give the audience the idea that they're not watching a documentary. I had a screening of Zero de Conduit because um, I think very much the idea of the structure of the film, because the structure of it is not uh, a conventional narrative structure. Um, the story doesn't begin until quite late in the film, really. No. Mm. And I think it was just that idea of um, a poetic style, a poetic film, which is not very characteristic of British films. British films, on the whole, are have been much more naturalistic in style. That's another reason why the films that I've made are, uh, shall I say, stick out rather like sore thumbs. I mean, Oh Lucky Man is not a typical British film, is it? No, none of them are, really. No. Well, they've got something in common, though, between Oh Lucky Man and Britannia Hospital, and it. Yes. There so, 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 do seem to be common threads. It's true. Yes.